Okay, now I know you've already had a chance to have a chat to everyone, um, but I feel like we should have a little bit more time to chat whilst the preacher gets himself ready. <laughs> it's, it's Luke, he's pre-recorded it. Um, but yeah, have a turn to the person next to you and I want you to ask them, what is it that you like or don't like about spring? Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdom of the world. He said to him, I give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command all his angels concerning you to guide you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really sorry I can't be there with you in person this morning, but unfortunately, uh, our household has been hit with the wilderness of COVID once again. Um, Karen, this time, so far, so good for me, but um, sorry to not be there with you. Um, However, I prepared this sermon uh, earlier, and so... uh, we have recorded it for you uh, to finish off our series, Ways in the Wilderness, uh, which we've been doing for the last seven Sundays. And uh, we started this series in Luke chapter 4, the same passage that you've just read. Um, but I wanted to come back to it this morning uh, because I think it highlights something absolutely critical about how God uh, can use a, a tough time, a wilderness kind of experience in our lives to lead us into a greater experience of his love and abundant life in him. So uh, first of all, let me tell you about uh, a guy by the name of Evagrius Ponticus. I want to read an excerpt from uh, John Mark Comer's book uh, called Live No Lies, uh, where he talks about this guy. So uh, uh, it says this, late in the 4th century AD, um, a young intellectual named Evagrius Ponticus went into the desert of Egypt to fight the devil. Like you do. Evagrius had read the story of Jesus going out into the desert to face the devil head on and intended to follow Jesus' example, quite literally. Uh, Soon word got out. There was a monk out in the middle of nowhere at war with the devil. Apparently, rumor said, he was winning. He became a sought-after spiritual guide. Spiritual seekers would brave the dangers of the elements in an attempt to locate Evagrius and learn his tactics. Before Evagrius' death, a fellow monk named Lucios asked him to write down his strategy to overcome the devil. As a result, Evagrius penned a short book called Talking Back, a monastic handbook for combating demons. Best subtitle ever. So I, I wonder as you listen to that, what comes to mind if, if you were to think of this, this handbook for combating demons that Evagrius Ponticus in the 4th century penned uh, whilst out in the desert fighting the devil. Um, I don't know about you, but I would expect to find some kind of weird stuff in there, stuff that would be 
pretty irrelevant to you know the the life that we live today. Um, and John Mark Comer uh, in his book uh, writes the same thing. He said he he went to read this and expected to find a bunch of weird Christian style magic incantations, uh, the incoherent ramblings of a pre modern introvert who spent too much time under the North African sun. Uh, maybe you had the same thought. However, uh, here's what uh, Coma writes um, about his experience of reading this handbook for combating demons. Instead, I found an erudite mind who was able to articulate mental processes in ways that neuroscientists and leading psychologists are just now catching up to. For example, he was able to articulate preverbal thought, how emotions are made, mind sight, and more. Now, maybe it's just me, but I just don't think we would expect that from a desert monk's handbook for combating demons. But I think that's because we 21st century kind of enlightened intellectuals, we suffer from what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery, right? Chronological snobbery, the idea that we've uh, intellectually advanced past what our great-grandparents and their great-grandparents and their ancestors were able to know and understand, that we're somehow more advanced humans, more evolved, more enlightened is the usual language, uh, than they were back then. Chronological snobbery. And so concepts like a devil um, and demons, th th these sort of become childish myths, which we no longer need to believe because we're not into that stuff anymore. And, and, and we can even take this to an extent where we say, well, then the Bible needs to be, you know, reinterpreted to fall in line with our en enlightened minds. And this has been a huge issue in the church over the last couple of centuries. What if, in fact, the writings of fourth century, a fourth century monk who took the spiritual realm seriously, going out to the desert to fight the devil, um, and the accounts of, of, of Jesus resisting the devil in the wilderness. What if these actually address the issues we face in the 21st century even more effectively than the latest research and, and, and the latest wisdom that's available to us? I guess what I'm saying is, is it possible that God knew best all along? I want to pose to you today that uh, there really is a devil. There really is a real being, not just a symbol for evil in the scriptures. And I won't have to convince some of you of this, but others are going, oh, I'm not sure what I think about this. Many have written over the centuries that, that, that Christians fall into one of two traps. One is an unhealthy obsession uh, about the devil and demons, and that's unhealthy. Um, the other is a denying that he even exists. Uh, in his brilliant book, uh, The Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis writes these letters of an older demon to a younger trainee demon who's who's going after his patient, and um, he's, he's saying, convince him that we don't exist. Um, a number of times, in a number of different ways. This is one of my favorite quotes. I don't think you will have much difficulty in keeping your patient in the dark. Remember, this is the older demon writing to the younger. Uh, the fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that uh, since he cannot believe in that, it is an old textbook method of, of confusing them, he therefore cannot believe in you. <laughs> um, I highly recommend Screw Tate Letters. It's a, it's a great read. Um, personally, one of the reasons I think that it's so dangerous to not believe in the existence of the demonic is because we end up demonizing people instead. What I mean by that is, you know, we are hardwired to fight against whatever or whoever is disrupting and destroying what is good in the world. That's a good thing. Like we want to fight. It's been built into us by God that we want to fight against what it, what goes against the goodness he's put in the world. Um, now, some fight and push against God because they think God's trying to ruin their lives. I presume that's not you because you're in church this morning. But unless we recognize the true enemy, we naturally end up pointing the blame at other people. 
And however flawed or even a person is, I'm not saying this to, to, to get people off scot-free. Like if we allow the, the work of the enemy to be channeled through us, then we, we need to take responsibility for that. But every single human being, every single human being is, is created by God, loved by God, purposed for good. And he wants to bring every single person into an eternal relationship with himself. It's the devil who is the enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And all evil we see in the world, whether it's channeled through a human or not, is his doing. He's the one we fight against, not any human being. And so we, if we don't believe he exists, if we think it's just a myth, we naturally end up demonizing others. But the primary point I want to make today is, is, is this, that, uh, and, um, why Luke chapter 4 and, and the writings of 4th century monks are so relevant, relevant to today is this. The devil has one primary strategy. One. One game plan. One trick he pulls out over and over and over again. And that is lies. Lies. Deception. I wish I had time to unpack all the, the, the ways the scripture highlights this, but, but this is who he is. He's the deceiver, the great dragon who, quote, deceives the whole world, the ancient serpent who, quote, leads the whole world astray, the father of lies, right? He's a liar. That is, and this is the primary strategy of the enemy. And I highlight this today because I, I believe God wants to do something life-giving with the the, the tough, dry, wilderness experiences that you and I face. He wants to, God wants to expose the lies and speak truth to you and I because this leads us into life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, the truth will set you free. Jesus is all about speaking truth to us. Now, some of that's hard truth. Some of that's truth we long to hear, but all of it brings life. And Jesus wants this for us. Now, what, what Evagrius wrote in, about in his handbook for combating demons was basically uh, that you fight against the demonic temptation, against demonic temptation. Uh, it, what it is, is it is a fight against the logos moi. That, that's a Greek word, which means thoughts or thought patterns, your internal narratives, your internal belief structures. Basically, the enemy lies to us. And these truths lead us down paths that ruin our relationship with God, with others, with ourselves. They lead to death, not to life. But there's, um, and so God wants uh, for us to to hear truth. Now, there's a bit more to it than just the devil whispering in our ear. And so it's important for us to understand that until relatively recently, Christians would so often refer to three things. This unholy trinity of the devil, the flesh, and the world. And these all work together. So the devil, yes, feeds lies in that try to lead us astray. But we also have these inbuilt desires that the, the, essentially this animal nature, this animalistic um, urge, urges and, 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 and primal kind of desires that also lie to us. That they're not. That we don't necessarily act with love and selflessness um, out of our flesh, is what the Bible calls it. But what, it's what feels good. What's sort of natural? The natural urges, and the Bible calls this the flesh. And un unlike animals, we have the capacity to make choices to either submit to those desires of the flesh or choose a better way. When these desires, i.e. what feels good, when this becomes normalized in society, it feeds the lie that what feels good naturally leads to flourishing because um, it's, it's happening all around us. Um, and so we don't necessarily need the, the devil whispering in our ear or even our own bodies urging us, but the culture around us which has become uh, this the normalization of sin, the culture around us screams, do this, it's good. The most obvious example of where the flesh, the world, normalized sin in the culture, and the devil kind of converge. Uh, the most obvious example in our world right now is, is human sexuality. 
uh, since the sexual revolution, um, this new vision for good, life-giving sexual relationships uh, entered, uh, which is counter to God's vision for sex and marriage. And uh, this new vision for, you know, sexual relationships fit right in with the desires of our bodies, the desires of the flesh, right? Um, And then it becomes, over time, it became normal to embrace an approach to sexuality that doesn't lead to life and health because everyone's doing it, right? The world now normalized a way counter to God's way. And so now a lie is something we, we couldn't possibly often see as problematic because the devil, the flesh, and the world all say to us in the area of sexuality, this is the way that is good. And so it's really hard to see that that's, that's a lie. But God says through his word, actually, this is the truth. and This leads to life. That's just an example, and we could talk for, for weeks about this whole flesh devil in the world um, trifecta. Um, but my goal today is is to encourage you that even though this is the case, there's something very powerful God wants to do in a difficult or dry situation that you and I face, a, a wilderness experience. Uh, this unholy trinity of the world, the flesh, and the devil can be lying to us, robbing us of an abundant life. Uh, when when life is seemingly going well, we can be having a great time in life. We can be taking what the world has to warfare, but in the midst of that, actually believing a lie and living a lie. Maybe not a, a huge one, but just subtle things. We're, we're, we're not necessarily experiencing life to the full, which comes from intimate relationship with God, but we, we think life's pretty good. And so when something goes wrong in that, time, when there's a painful experience, that's when God will use the the pain, use the wilderness experience to expose the lie and lead us to the truth. We're sort of ticking along and, and, oh, I thought that was fun. You know, I thought that way of living seemed fulfilling, but now it hasn't come through for me. The lie can be exposed. But let me give you an example of this um, and, and kind of how it might play out. Um, let's consider Sally. Sally is a, a Christian in her early 20s. And Sally uh, has just landed her dream job. Now, Sally is a Christian who has worked hard in school and uni for, for, for many, many years. And she's prayed fervently that God would give her this, this dream job, right? And it's finally happened. She she got the job and, and now she is so grateful to God. She's so grateful to God that she can finally be happy because she's got this job now. Her dreams have come true, right? God must be good because he granted her dreams and, and fulfilled her great longing. But her job um, relies on her being on her feet much of the day, being active. Um, and, and look, that's not a problem because Sally is is fit and she's active and uh, she's healthy. Um, but then last Tuesday at netball training, uh, she broke her ankle. And uh, for Sally, this is it was a bad injury and it was going to be a, a three to six month recovery. And the boss, upon you know her, her telling the boss this, the boss decided... Um, well, that's that's just too long. So unfortunately, Sally, we're going to have to let you go. We'll find someone else. And so Sally is devastated, as you can imagine. She, she, the dream job was hers, but now it's gone. And now she's angry at God. How could he give her this job only to take it away from her? Doesn't he know how depressed she'll become without this? This was her dream for years and years and years. And she prayed and then she got it. How could it just go all of a sudden? How could this happen? Why would you let this happen, God? Let's pause for a second and observe. What's happened with Sally? She got the job. God even helped orchestrate that and and allow that to happen. And so it's true that God is good and she's right to be thankful to him. But there's a thought in there, a belief, the thought that she can finally be happy because 
she's got this job. And that's a lie. It's not a blatant, obvious lie, kind of like um, cocaine will make your life better in every way. That's just an obvious lie, right? But this is a lie that sounds like truth. God wants her happiness is true. God granted her this job and gave her this job and that's true. But God wants my happiness and therefore he's granted me this job to make me happy. There's lots of truth in that belief, but ultimately it's put together to make a lie. Her happiness doesn't stem from the job itself. So then she loses the job, the dreams are shattered and enters a wilderness experience. And what happens next? Well, 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 first of all, the the lie is amplified for Sally, right? Sally doesn't immediately go, oh, now I see that I was getting my happiness from the wrong thing. The lie is amplified, you know, the, the, the lie is amplified first. God, I'm only happy with this job. How could you do this to me? How could you let this happen? That's what happens first. But it's here in this wilderness that Sally has an opportunity. And the opportunity is to discover the truth, to replace the lie with the truth. The truth is you don't need a certain job to be happy and content. Happiness and contentment is found in a relationship with God, the relationship she already has. She's a Christian, but she's believed a lie. And God wants to replace it with his truth because the job will eventually let her down. But God won't. Now, we, we, we believe um, all sorts of lies, right? Little ones, big ones. And when we face a tough season, when we face a wilderness kind of experience, when we face a trial, a painful test, at first the lie is amplified, right? It's, it's amplified. God, I need that person. How could you take them? I, I thought you cared about me, God. God, I can't, right? The lie is amplified. When we, we face something tough, as opposed to when things are kind of seem to be going all right. I, I think uh, about, for example, the Israelites in Egyptian captiv- captivity. If you know the story, they're, they're uh, slaves to the Egyptians. And as slaves in Egypt, I imagine them sort of saying, look, I, I know we have food on our tables and a roof over our heads, but we're still slaves. Maybe God doesn't love us. Right? There's the lie. It's sort of just a question and a, and a and it's subtle but then they're brought out of Egypt and they had to navigate the wilderness and and the lie is amplified they start saying why have you brought us here to die we'd be better off in Egypt translation god definitely doesn't love us right and yet the wilderness for them expo- uh, posed an opportunity the lie isn't just amplified. What happens is the lie is exposed. And now it can be chopped off at the head and replaced with the truth. God's love isn't dependent on your particular circumstances. That's the truth. He always provides for you just what you need when you need it. That's the truth. He loves you and knows what's best for you to reply, rely completely on him because he's the only one who will never fail. And they begin, the Israelites in this place, begin to learn this truth with the experience of the manna and the quail, God providing for them every single day. The lie is exposed and, it, and it's replaced with truth, God's truth. Consider Jesus then in the wilderness. This passage we read earlier on today, once again, it's, it's there in the wilderness that Jesus is faced with lies, crafty words, temptations that speak right to the flesh. Uh, the devil saying, take the power you're destined for, but take it the easy way. Yeah. Avoid the pain. Come on, take the shortcut, Jesus. Right, And, and Jesus, is, his body would be saying, oh, the, that actually sounds really good. These lies are loud and they're in his face and, and it's, they speak right to what Jesus naturally desired. That, and he'd be saying, that sounds, maybe this is a good way to go. Maybe it's even tr- Maybe it's not such a bad thing if I do this. Remember, the devil quoted scripture at Jesus. 
right? He disguised lies inside of truths. But Jesus in that moment becomes the model of how we enter life in all its fullness. While the lie is exposed, replace it with God's truth. How do we combat the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil? I think we practice the the ways of Jesus that orient us towards truth. We replace the lies with the truth that God speaks, the truth that sets free, the truth that leads to life. We do that with the practices of Jesus. And what I mean by that is disciplines that help us deny the flesh. See, we can't control the world and and the, 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 the society around us and what it normalizes in terms of sinful practices. And we can't control the devil, right? But when it comes to the world, the devil and the flesh, it all converges in the flesh because the flesh is what we can control. Um, we can't change what the enemy is going to say. We can't change what the world's saying, but we can live in ways and live with disciplines that deny the flesh and the, the things in our, in our inbuilt animal nature that would lead us astray and lie to us. We can actually live with these, these disciplines that say no to the flesh. Disciplines like daily time in scripture, silent prayer, Sabbath, sacrificial community, confession of sins to one another, stuff that we don't naturally want to do because it's, it's, it's sacrificial. Some of it's painful, but it's stuff that trains our bodies um, and, and more importantly, shapes our soul. I don't have time to go into the body, soul, spirit relationship, but what's happening when we live in, with these disciplines, these practices of Jesus, which deny the flesh, what happens is that our soul is now formed more and more by the spirit than, than by our bodies. And it helps us to live in a way by the spirit that we experience the life that God has for us. Wish I had more time to go into that before today. I just want to highlight one simple practice, one thing that we can do to uh, replace the lies of the devil, the flesh, and the world with the truth of God's word. Um, Evagrius's handbook for combating demons was essentially dozens of chapters that started uh, with this line, against the thought that. That's how it, it all started, every chapter of this book, against the thought that. So, so he took a lie perpetrated by the devil, the flesh, the world. He addressed it and replaced it with the truth of scripture. And that was his handbook for combating demons. <laughs> and so believe it or not, I'm going to encourage you to, uh, after today, to create your own monastic handbook for combating demons. Now, um, you may or may not want to do this literally, pen and paper. Um, this may be more of a practice you want to start to practice in just in your prayer life, in your mind. But uh, I encourage you, have, have a go at doing this on paper. Here's, here's how we do this. Start by identifying what's the thought, the feeling, or the sensation. Right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about losing my job and, and not being able to repay our debt. Right, um, I'm 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 struggling um, with a with a temptation to towards this substance or towards pornography or whatever it might be. What's the thought, the feeling, the sensation that's 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 um, you know uh, you're struggling with? What's the then the second thing is what's the lie beneath the thought, the feeling, or the sensation that reveals your attachment? So, for example, my safety and security are in my job. And owning newer, nicer things will make me happy. That might be the lie beneath the thought or the feeling of being worried about your job. And then finally, the third thing is what's the truth? We've identified the thought, the feeling, sensation, identified the lie beneath that, but what's the truth? For example, Hebrews 13, 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said 
Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Now I recognize um, th- th- this concept of 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 um, of, of uh, lies and devil and flesh and everything and going home and creating a monastic handbook for combating demons. Some of you will have listened today and gone, Luke, this all sounds a bit wacko, super spiritual, superstitious to me. And and look, I can live with that. Um, but this series. This this Ways in the Wilderness series hasn't been for those who are just sort of ticking along pretty comfortably right now thinking, you know what, life's pretty good. This series has been for those who are looking stuff in the face right now and going, you know what, this really sucks. It's for people who need some hope right now. And friends, the hope is this. God... The God who loves you is exposing the lies of a revolting, evil, demonic, horrific being who wants you dead. And God is ready to replace those lies with the perfect truth so that you'll experience a greater measure of life in all its fullness. And so I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at this morning, identify, ask God to reveal, what's the lie? What are the lies you've believed or are believing? For some of you, it's super, superficial stuff. Um, you know, my job is what makes me happy. I need a boyfriend or girlfriend to fit in. For others, it's much darker thoughts. I'm no good for anything. I'm a failure. No one could ever love me. And, and here's one of the worst, right? Uh, here's one I've battled with for a, for a lot of years. God's disappointed with me. These are the lies we, we listen to. And in a wilderness experience, in a dry testing time, these lies can get real loud. But when they're exposed... God presents you with an amazing opportunity. Believe his truth. And here's the truth. You are God's masterpiece. You are a gift to the body of Christ. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God loves you so much that he gave his only son to save you. And you are his beloved With you, he is well pleased. So what's the lie you're believing? Ask God to show you. It may even sound a little bit like the truth. The best lies are half truths or almost true or full of little truths, but put together wrongly. But ask God to reveal it. Ask God to reveal the lie. If a wilderness is amplifying it, if a painful season is amplifying it right now, it may just be overwhelming you and you can't see it. But take a step back, see it for what it is, and proclaim God's truth in its place. Jesus promised this, and I'll just leave us with these words. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth is will set you free. Father, I want to bring my brothers and sisters in Christ before you today and ask that you would reveal the lies of the enemy that they've believed, that we've believed. And then in the coming days and weeks and months, Lord, you would begin to completely remove them and replace them with the truth of your word, the truth that sets free, the truth that leads us into life in all its fullness, the life that you want for us because you love us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.